when I do a video, edit a video, I try to use the application for about two or so weeks. That gives me enough time to play around with my workflow inside of the application, see what I can actually modify to make it so what I want to do actually works inside of the application, see what's missing from the application, and also gives me time to explore things that I wouldn't otherwise be using. Now, today we're looking at open shots. So, normally I would have edited about 14, at least 14 videos. Maybe I'll do the podcast in the editor, which would take me up to about 17 or 20 videos. In the case of open shot, though, I struggled to get through two videos with this because there are so many issues with the way it works, and it makes me so inefficient at working that I just couldn't bring myself to actually use it for all that time. Now, that's not to say I didn't try to use it and don't have a bunch of experience with it. It's just that every time I try to work with this application, I just want to go back to something like Olive. So, back when I started this channel, I was actually editing all of my videos with OpenShot, basically until I had a couple of corrupted save files and I discovered Kaden Live. So from then to now, it doesn't really seem like much has actually changed with the application, but I didn't realize how many problems there actually were with this. That's not to say that there's nothing good about OpenShot, it definitely has its selling points. Now the first thing that'll stand out is the interface, which is really bubbly and reminds me of something like Windows Movie Maker, which I don't necessarily think is a bad thing. Some people absolutely hate it, some people love it. For me, as long as the buttons are in a place that just makes sense and the application is just designed in a relatively decent way, I don't really care if they decide to use bubbly icons because most of the time I'm just going to be using hotkeys anyway. Now comparing this to Windows Movie Maker isn't intended to be an insult because it shares like a similar sort of position, which is it's a very simple video editor used by people who just want some sort of video editor. They don't really care about having all of these crazy features like you'd see in something like Caden Live, DaVinci or anything like that. The biggest selling point this has is with app integrations. So let's say we want to go and add a new title. So let's go and click the title button up here and click title. Now, there's a couple of pre-made ones in here, but let's say I like the clouds right here. So let's go and call this, I don't know, new title. And we'll leave the text as it is by default. So from here, most video editors would have some sort of built-in way to modify the way the title looks. In this case though, if we go and click on the use advanced editor, it's actually gonna go and open up this file inside of Inkscape. So I can go and modify this, you know, the same way you do anything inside of Inkscape. There's nothing special going on here. Let's make that one there. We'll make another copy of that one. And let's just move this over here or something, put the text back inside. And then if I save it and then quit out of this, as you're gonna notice, it actually modifies it over an open shot. And we can actually go and add this title into our timeline now. So rather than having to go and make something from scratch themselves, they're relying on an existing application that does everything they need. While I do prefer a good built-in solution, this is much better than having something that barely works. Now, when it comes to doing animated titles, it does integrate with Blender, but sadly it's not as good of an integration as what we see with Inkscape. So if we go and select something in here, like let's say the lens flare, we can't actually go and open this up inside of the advanced editor. That would be a really, really cool thing to see. It does give you control over a lot of properties though. However, I would like to have absolute control over this title. Now, all of the effects and transitions are listed in these two tabs right here. If your instance of OpenShot doesn't actually look like mine, it's because I'm actually running it with the advanced view. So if we go to the simple view, basically the only difference is those tabs are now integrated into this section right here. I don't really like this. I like to have them as like two separate windows. And also it doesn't show the properties on the left hand side all of the time. So I'd recommend just going and enabling the advanced view because it actually properly makes use of your screen space. The interface can be modified though. So if you go and click on the little square icon in here on the left hand side, you can actually move a window around and then you can like put it as its own separate window or you could say merge it together with a different window. Basic sort of window movement stuff, nothing really too crazy here, but I do like the default look of the advanced view. The effects here are very simple, but they very much do the job. So let's say I'm going to add a blur effect to this video track right here. So basically all I do is grab the blur and then drop it on the video track. And then if I want to go and modify the blur properties, if I have the video track selected, if we go and click on the drop down on the left hand side here, we'll see the blur right here. Sometimes it won't actually load. And in that case, you have to go and click off of the track 
and re-click on the track, but the other way you can do it that seems a bit more consistent is just clicking on the little blur icon on the video track itself. So let's go back over to the main properties, click that icon, and now we're actually on those properties. So there's not a ton you can modify here, but it is just a blur. So let's say I modify the horizontal radius, and everything in here is in alphabetical order rather than being in an order that just makes sense. So horizontal radius and vertical radius are on complete opposite ends of the list. Now, sadly, keyframes really shouldn't be in this application in the state they're in. So if we want to go and add a keyframe, let's say I want to go and add one right here. All we need to do is go and right click on the value itself, click insert keyframe, and you'll notice this tiny, tiny green line on the track itself. So let's go to a further point in the video and add a, another keyframe here. Let's add one right there and go and modify the value. So let's just turn that up like really high. And now going between these two points, it will go and uh, modify the blur. I'll just mute that. As it goes through that point, it will make the blur more and more and more, basically doing what a keyframe animation is supposed to do. Now, there's two things that are missing. One, you can't do keyframe stepping. So if you want to go to this keyframe right here, you have to position the playhead manually over that position. And also, if you modify an effect value, like let's say right here, it automatically adds in a keyframe. So you might accidentally add some keyframes and not really be sure what's going on. And then you have to go and like manually position the playhead over it to actually get rid of it. Now, even though most of the effects are fairly straightforward, none of them actually have proper tooltips. So if I hover over something like, say, hue, it says hue. Brightness and contrast, brightness and contrast. I can read the title. I don't exactly need a tooltip saying that. Now, the reason why that's a bit annoying is because if we go over to the details view, it actually does have a description for all of them. This should be what the tooltip says, not the actual name of the effect. Now, when it comes to transitions, if you want to fade from, say, the start of a video, that works perfectly fine. So let's grab the fade right here. And if I just play the video right here, as we're going to see, it fades in as you would expect a fade in to do. The default is a little bit long, but it works perfectly fine. Now, what if we wanted to go and fade between two videos? Well, if we go and put this, say, like, over the end of the two videos and try to play it like that, it will, like, jump in the middle of it. If we go and put it, like, here... It'll basically start this video completely from black and then fade that in rather than like being a fade between the two clips. So if you wanted to go and fade between two clips, I think you would basically have to redo the keyframes for the fade yourself. Or your other option is to completely ignore the fade transition, go and right click on the track, click on fade, click on the end of the clip and fade out. And what that's going to do is keyframe the alpha property. So even they realize the transitions don't exactly work properly and just encourage you to do it from the clip itself. We also have the same problem with the useless tooltips, except this time, if we go into the details view, we don't actually get a description. Now, I was surprised to see this, but we don't actually have an XML project file, but worry not because we still do have something in plain text. So if we go down to, I think it was called Untitled or something, uh, this one right here, it's actually a JSON file, which is still pretty easy to parse. Basically, every language has a built-in JSON library, so if you want to do some sort of parsing over this, should be just as easy. Sadly, though, even though I can actually go and add in markers, so with this button right here, that'll add a marker, there's no way to remove a marker, there's no way to add a title to the marker, so... The marker is pretty useless, so if I go and save this and reopen the file, if we go down to the markers in here, as we can see, yeah, the markers work perfectly fine, but without titles, I don't really see the point of them, and why is there no delete button? Another slightly annoying thing is with group movements, so luckily we actually can do group movement perfectly fine, unlike Flowblade, everything just works basically perfectly here, but if we go and let go of our selection, it automatically unselects everything. So if you, say, accidentally drop it, you have to go and reselect everything. It's not really that big of a deal, but I've never seen a video editor do that. Now, if you're like me and running Pulse Audio, you might open up OpenShot and realize you can't actually hear anything. So if we go into Edit and then into Preferences, if we go to Preview, by default, it's probably going to be set to the default ulcer output, and that's not going to work. So 
In my case, I set it to Pulse Audio Sound Server, and that just starts working perfectly fine. Another thing you probably want to do is go into Performance, and if you have something that supports VARPI, I would recommend going and enabling that, because by default, it's going to do CPU acceleration, which works fine if you have a decent CPU, but if you have a GPU, you might as well go and use the GPU. Now, back when I originally used OpenShot, I didn't realize there was any way to actually go and show the waveform for a video clip. Turns out there is, so what you do is you go and right click on the clip and go to display and show waveform and that will then show the waveform on the clip. Now you may also think you could go over to the properties menu and do waveform here. That doesn't actually do that, what it actually does is replaces the video with the waveform which I don't know why that's exactly a feature. It's nice to have like an effect that does that but why is that in the properties menu? So there's no way to go and enable the waveform globally, but you can go and just group select stuff and then go display, show waveform, and it will show the waveform on every clip. It might reset it though when you restart OpenShot. So I'm gonna do that right now and just see if it does that. So open shot QT, and it's happened a couple of times, so I'm guessing it's gonna do it this time. Yep, every time you restart OpenShot, it's going to unshow the waveform. When I record a video, I record my desktop and my microphone audio on separate tracks and I want both of those to be in the final product. Obviously, for regular videos like this, it doesn't really matter, but for the podcast, the guest's audio is a part of my desktop audio, so not having that there makes the podcast worthless. OpenShot doesn't let me import both of the tracks. When I import a video, it only imports the first track and there's no way to change anything about that. Obviously, I could go and manually import the audio tracks, but I'd much rather just use an editor that just lets me import it correctly. Now, I thought there might have been a solution. So if I right click on this and then go to the separate audio, there's the single clip, all channels, and multi clips, each channel. I thought maybe this would show me the other tracks. It doesn't actually do that. It just shows the audio track on a separate track. But don't actually separate your audio out like this because if you do, OpenShot is probably just gonna crash. That's happened, I think about 10 times in the last like five minutes. I've been trying to re-record this clip, seeing if it just doesn't crash. Nope, every single time it will crash. Now, as long as you don't do that, the timeline isn't unusable. It does tend to slow down occasionally, but it's not a major deal, and if you have a decent system, you can work around it. One thing I can't work around, though, is that OpenShot straight up breaks MKV clips. So, I'm going to play a video for you. This one right here. So, if we go right to the end of this, I'm supposed to finish my sentence as I'm talking, but just listen. Is a fully graphical web browser rendered inside of your turn. Every single MKV clip is like that, but it doesn't do it to MP4. Only MKV. Also, I'm not really sure what the deal is here, but if you scroll out enough, it doesn't actually extend the timeline to the end of your window, but it's not like it has like a, a time limit cap. Right now it says 25 minutes, but right now it says 10 hours. So for some reason, it's just not using up all of the interface space. One other little thing is sometimes when you open up the preferences menu, some of these items in here won't actually be taking up the entire screen. It seems to be working just fine right now, but occasionally I've opened it up and one of these bars would just be like using half the screen. It's not a major deal. Once you close the preferences, you'll never see it again but it is just something to note. Actually, before I forget, if you want to go and set some new hotkeys, you can go and rebind everything in the application, but you have to actually write out the name of the key. So instead of just, you know, pressing Control H and it fills in Control H, you actually have to write out Control plus H. So if you have any spelling mistakes in here, it just won't accept the key binding. Now, I think you can probably tell my conclusion on OpenShot. The reason why I didn't mention things like, say, cutting clips and moving clips in the timeline and things like that is because they work about as well as every other video editor out there. The only reason why I mention them in some others is because they're either exceptionally weird or exceptionally good. Here, they basically work as well as you'd expect, but I'm not going to be using OpenShot going forward. I really hated this experience. Next up, I'm going to be using Shotcut. I've tried it a little bit so far, and you know what? Shotcut's pretty good. I've got a lot of problems with it, but it actually has a lot of potential. 
I think that's going to be pretty much everything for me. Before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to... I should have opened up the list first. Chris, Joachim, Donald, Michael, Andre, Nathan, David, Monster, Will, Brandon, Chico, Benton, Jamie, Joseph, Mitchell, Peter, Lee, Stephen, Tony, Shushar, and all of my two dollars supporters. If you'd like to go support my work, the links down below. It's my Patreon, subscribe, star, leave a pay, all of that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over Tea, available basically anywhere. And then this channel is available on Library, Odyssey, and BitChute if you want to watch on a platform that isn't YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.